everyone. This is Matthew Kaplan from InMobi's marketing team and very excited today to be joined in conversation with Lee Hirsch. Lee, thanks for joining us. Good to be here. Um, so Lee, I have the opportunity to interview uh, a number of different folks here uh, at InMobi, but of course, I think your, your role and background is a little different than the, the kind of folks I have the opportunity to, to talk to at InMobi. So for, for those who don't know or are tuning in, can you give a little bit of, of overview about yourself? Oh yeah, I'd be happy to. So um, I'm a documentary filmmaker primarily um, and a storyteller. Um, and uh, for the last four political cycles, um, together with my partner, Houston King, we also run a small, kind of like a boutique, almost super pack, um, where we uh, try and really like tell a different kind of story. We really try and like tap into something much more authentic and honest and real, um, feeling like that's kind of often what's lacking in political messaging. Um, and that's kind of like what leads us to talk to each other today in, 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 in particular, because we were able to, to work together this political cycle. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm known for uh, two of the films that I've made I'm, I'm most known for. One is uh, the documentary about uh, the role of music and protest songs in the struggle against apartheid in South Africa, which is called Amandla, a revolution in four part harmony. And then also a documentary about um, bullying and what kids um, and families face when it comes to that kind of peer on peer violence and um, threat. And that that's a movie called Bully. And so um, that's, uh, that's a little bit about me. Great. Yeah, and, and uh, as you mentioned, you know, uh, Local Voices and then Moby had a chance to work together this election cycle. And, and before we, we go into that relationship, um, can you speak a little bit more about Local Voices? You know, how did you decide to, to found that? Um, you know, kind of to speak a little bit more about what the, the impetus was, uh, especially since uh, the words boutique and super pack don't often <laughs> go together. Well, it's like super pack implies something huge and like, you know, super well funded and we're kind of not that. We're very like grassroots and um, specific about what we try and do and um, and, un and aware of our limitations in terms of fundraising. So it's, I, I felt like similar like boutique was as good a word as any, but um, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, back in 2007, 2008, um, I was like, many people wanted to play as best a role as I could in getting President Obama elected and wanted to see if I could do more than just kind of, not that there's any, not that, no pun intended, not to knock it, but door, you know, do a little more than just door knocking or phone banking. I wanted to put my skill set uh, into the field. And I'd long been frustrated by these sort of generic political ads that were kind of like attack ads or this sort of voice of God coming from like, you know, some marketing firm in DC or got, you know, usually just DC um, that always felt to me like it didn't actually speak to people where they were at it either. Like it just felt like we were missing a tremendous opportunity to um, connect with voters in a different way um, through through political ads and through through video and um, and so what our insight was was that um, we wanted to go into small areas small cities and find unlikely messengers people that are not well known they're not the mayor they're not like you know the kid that went off and got a Heisman Trophy. They're like people that are like well known and kind of quietly loved within a community who generally aren't considered partisan and um, are just like liked or respected. And then we would film their story or why, they, why they're choosing to vote for a Democrat or in this case, um, President Obama. Um, and then we would build an ad campaign, a, a buying strategy that um, was specific to that area. So if we were in Joplin, Missouri, and we found this wonderful character, then we would take our limited resources and do ad buys in Joplin, Missouri. And the argument being that if people saw their own neighbors, 
and people from their community that we could have greater impact and we could move that needle in that one small piece of territory, right? And, and we've done that over the last four cycles at scale, you know, usually somewhere between like 30 and 60 ads a cycle. Um, and so it's also been something that quite frankly, it's been very hard for people to, to, to understand the value of that, right? Like people tend to um, think at the state level or they're not, um, I, I've yet to see any major donors like on, you know, or, or orgs that are the sort of like larger players really embrace this idea that we could like, for a limited budget, we could target and pinpoint swing cities, swing counties within swing states, and that that's a valuable effort and that, that we would have an opportunity to be more persuasive at that by doing that than by hoping for like the generic lift from, you know, an overall state statewide strategy. Um, and so that's a little bit about local voices and what's driven us is like, we love like getting out and talking to people. We love being in the heartland. We love just the sort of like quiet strength and integrity that we find when we meet people. Um, this cycle, we focused a lot on, we did, you know, we really did two things. We did, um, we focused a lot on that strategy, but particularly we looked at people that had voted for Trump in 2016, but that were sort of peeling away um, and felt that that was an important message to amplify and, and create a permission structure for people to sort of let go of that and feel okay about that and understand that they're not alone. Um, and then the other thing that we did, which is, you know, I think where we were very successful in working with you guys was we, um, created a program called Fearless Messengers. And Fearless Messengers was really an attempt to harness what I saw as like incredibly authentic and consistent creative that was coming from young creators on TikTok that was super like strategic and smart and savvy and fun and different and way cooler than anything I could create to talk to 20 year olds, quite frankly. Um, and, uh, and we took, we built a program where we were able to build relationships with about 30 of those creators and help sort of guide their content. But then we were able to take their content off of the TikTok platform and turn it into ads, which we then worked with Imobi to put uh, inside games and apps. Yeah, I, I really loved, uh, I love taking a look at, at all the, the creatives. And I, I think it is such an interesting approach because TikTok is, is so widely covered. I think people, many people are now aware of TikTok, but I think maybe people aren't quite aware of the sort of the, the talent and the, you know, the, the themes that, that exist on, on TikTok and, and what it really looks like. Yeah, I mean, I think that there was a sense of like, TikTok doesn't allow political advertising, so we're not going to contemplate that. There was enough, there's enough platforms that we've been trying to figure out for years that we're going to put our bets there. So, you know, I think, I think in part, what was cool about what we did is we figured out a way to sort of like take that energy and target it and make it um, and weaponize it really in a way in terms of political content by like drilling it down as best we could into um, sort of targeted ads, right? And, and the other thing that I would say um, for me, and I don't know if this is a knock on like in Moby or the ad space within games is like, I don't know why there aren't more like narrative ads inside of apps and games. Like, I think it's just people haven't caught on to that yet because, and I'm not a big gamer. I'm not really somebody that's like into that, but like I got into playing Scrabble, for example, <laughs> and I didn't want to pay for the, like whatever the $8 a month to be able to play ad free Scrabble on my phone, which just seemed ridiculous. But like, the ads that you get served up are like 
A, they don't they don't speak to me in any way, shape, or form because they're 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 for these like esoteric games that like I'm not interested in. And I find that like it's all the same ad. Like there's no variety. There's no like it's all just these annoying like things that you're trying to like get to close. And um and so until you figure out that you just actually have to sit and watch it, which took me a while to kind of realize I wasn't trying to like get out of it. I had to like just sit through it and then I could get anyway. Shows you how much like I knew about the space before we started. So so I really felt like like we could be forward in a space where there wasn't a lot of political dialogue taking place, but yet there are a lot of voters, right? And a lot of potential voters and a lot of audience that, you know, where it wasn't like Facebook where you were just getting served up ad after ad after ad after ad that was political. You weren't, wasn't like, um, uh, you know, TV where you're just constant. if you live in spring state, you're constantly bombarded. And I thought that like, if we could serve up this creative, that was kind of fun and challenging and like youthful and non-traditional within that space, that we would have something that, that we'd at least be able to tell a story about and that hopefully would, would, would connect to people. And in fact, we I think we were really pleased with the outcome. Yeah, I, I think your, your point kind of speaks to there's a larger disconnect in the sense that I think if you say gaming, especially digital gaming, I think most people think of a, a certain kind of gamer perhaps comes in, into their mind. And I think what you, sh- what we show and, and how we work together is that, you know, everyone plays games. They're really kind of the new mainstream entertainment medium. Um, and I, th- I think it's great that you kind of realized this, this untapped opportunity. Cause yeah, a lot of political advertisers are just kind of going through the, the motions and using the same kind of strategies that they used in 2016, 2012. Um, I was curious, you know, as you, as you got started on your, your in-app, um, advertising journey for the first time, you know, what, what surprised you, um, in, in terms of, of working in this space? I think what surprised me was, was definitely like the click through numbers, right? I sort of I sort of thought that we would reach people because that was the idea was that we would have you know um, we would we would buy views and that that would be something that we could track and understand what that would cost and I think we were able to buy more views than we thought we would be able to which was exciting um, in terms of just the, the sort of like ROI for what we had because as I said we are kind of humble compared to other campaigns or packs or C4s that, you know, have that kind of budget. Um, so in that way, I think there was a really strong ROI, which was really like nice for us to be able to see that unfold. Um, but I think more importantly is that we were, you know, we, we were sort of driving to vote.org, which was a nonpartisan site where people could learn how to like make sure that they knew how to vote or got registered or knew when the deadlines were or, where their polling place was. And I think we had, I forget what the total aggregate number was, but it was, I think it was like over 30,000 click throughs to um, get more information on voting. And I think that like seeing that taking place at scale for the, for what we were able to do was really rewarding because, you know, that felt like the most powerful indicator of success. Um, but also like there were probably many people that were already registered that, um, or knew where their polling place were and maybe got that extra push. So it's hard to, you know, I think we'll still be trying to like chop up and understand the data as best we can. But um, I think, you know, I also thought that from a, um, and obviously my colleague Houston was the more direct day to day um, person on, on like the, account, if you will, in terms of like managing all the tweaks and adjustments and buys. I know that like the bits that I participated in and from my like conversations with him, like we were very impressed by the level of customer care and support and service that we got. And it really helped us rather than making us feel like a bunch of newbies that didn't know what we were doing and kind of getting taken advantage of. 
which I think could easily happen. I think we felt very nurtured and cared for and um, uh, really like everybody, it felt like had the objective of seeing our campaign be successful, even though it was relatively modest. And I think that that was really cool. Yeah, I, I think it, it does sort of speak to, you know, I think it's from a, a user perspective, it's easy, especially on a game, um, it's easy to see an ad as obtrusive, annoying, and I think it, it doesn't, it's to no one's benefit to kind of run advertising that you don't want to see, that doesn't benefit you, that doesn't provide you with any, any value in it. Um, in some ways, I think you have to have more of a, a value exchange in mobile than you do on, on TV. Um, you know, yes, you can, you can turn off the television set, but if I, you know, uninstall the game on my phone, well, that's a huge, huge loss. Um, and so I think you have to be careful with, with how you're, you're running advertising and, and making sure that everything is, is going well. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, there's definitely games that I've decided that aren't, that just aren't worth the, like, the frustration level. They're not worth the money and they're not worth the frustration level. <laughs> and there's others that you put up with. So I think that's a very good point is that there's, there's a fine balance there and maybe like, I mean, maybe what will happen in time is like other advertisers will ca will click on to the opportunity in the space and and better work will rise up. But it's I mean, but it also does feel appropriate that games are advertised in the space. Right. So it's a hard it's a hard balance, you know, but um, maybe from my perspective, it's just that I don't I don't speak in game language or something or I don't I don't process that way. So for me, it's like if I had things that were more entertaining to get me through those breaks, I would probably more be more, uh, have a more positive, uh, have a more positive impact on both the brand and the game itself. Sure. Yeah. I mean, yes, you know, I think people who play games, they, they may like to hear about other games, but there's more that they are than just a, a gamer, right? They're a voter. They're, you know, they have many other hobbies and interests. And there's people that are like, you know, on apps or games that aren't like even gamer, like me, like I'm not a gamer, but I, you know, play Scrabble online, you know? And so that's, I mean, I'm sure, I mean, it's the whole spectrum, right? Of people that are like, that are, that are, that are seeing these types of ads. And, um, you know, I, I think, yeah. Yeah. So one thing I, I'm very curious to hear your perspective on. So, uh, you know, there's kind of a tried and true formula for, for telling a story on a television screen um, or on a movie screen. Obviously, a lot of, of innovation and thought is, is put into how you tell a story and how you entertain and educate on those screens. And, and in some ways that the, the mobile environment um, is, is very different in terms of attention span, in terms of video orientation. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts, you know, as you started to think more about mobile and in and, and app, how did your approach to video storytelling um, change as a result? I mean, I mean listen, I, I, I am at my core a feature filmmaker, right? So like my sweet spot is like an hour and 20 minutes, <laughs> you know, it's like 90 minutes and up, you know? and um, I have struggled in my like career as everyone's attention spans have gotten shorter, both with clients, with um, ads that I've made. I also do traditional advertising outside of like the political space. Um, it's hard to do something that's really beautiful and narrative and then try and chop it down to 30 seconds or 15 seconds or five seconds. <laughs> like, there's an art to it, you know, and I think that I think that the biggest lesson I've learned out of this sort of enterprise is that if you want to make ex like effective and successful short form content that's persuasive, like go to the creators that are doing that, like inherently, because that's like how their brains are wired. You know, if you look at like, a lot of our creators that we were able to partner with that we found on TikTok, they're already thinking that way. Like 
for me, it's like I'm trying to like step into those shoes. And, you know, it's a lot more effective to, I think, learn from them or harness what they're making and then be the sort of like aggregator and the conduit for that as opposed to trying to take like really emotional long form political ads or stories and make them work in the content. And we were successful in some of them, you know, some of them you can find that like sweet spot, that simple line, you know, that simple through, you know, that simple way of communicating, but it is, it does require a ship. Um, and I don't think it's like, I don't think that the answer to being successful in mobile or, you know, in this very short format is just cut downs. I think it's rethinking the, the content from the sort of ground up in terms of um, the messaging and how you're, how you're structuring the, 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 the piece of advertising. Sure. Yeah. I mean, think on, on mobile, the expectations are just inherently in some way so different that you have to think mobile first. I was saying uh, one thing I, I think I would love your perspective on is so, you know, mo- so much of, of television and television advertising and of course movies are all uh, horizontal orientation. Um, but most people don't hold their, their phone horizontally. They, they hold their phone vertically as far as the, you know, the visual side of it. Um, is there anything about, you know, helping out with, with, I guess, vertical um, visuals that surprised you or that you, you enjoyed or, or thought were, was interesting? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, it's just a different, it's a different, like, it, again, it's like you want to be like creating there first, right? Like it's very hard to take 16 by nine material and make it work on what is it a five what did, i forgot the numbers are but like on that sort of vertical phone dimensions um you have to try and like get the person this it's just not shot for that it's not designed for that so i think that like um with the yeah i mean it's interesting i want to just wonder like what would happen if we evolved our phones this way instead of this way <laughs> you know over time but like but this is the world that we live in and i think mobile content is served up that way. And I mean, obviously like when people watch Netflix on their phones or something like that, they are turning their phones. So, I mean, I still think that there's, I, I'm curious what the like psychological difference is in terms of like people's perception of something. Like if it's quality, do they want to like flip their phone? You know, like I know sometimes like I'll be watching something in vertical and if it's good, if I care enough, I'll turn my phone and like expand it and get the full view. So I think it's, I think it's interesting, but in the context of like an ad, obviously like you're going to have to, you have to create in that format as best you can. And so I think again, like by taking like content that was created for TikTok, um, for that environment or for like, and, and then sort of, editing that down or doing whatever it took to get us to, you know, but even I'm thinking now, like even our young creators were not necessarily making 10 second things or 15 second things. They were making thirties or sixties and some were 15, you know what I mean? So we're still getting, it's still hard to synthesize that message down. And then you're also working on a different, um, kind of frame size as well. But um, I guess I don't have a huge, like, I don't know that it's like creatively better or worse. I think it's just different. Sure. Yeah. It's, you know, every, every screen is just going to have its own expectations. Um, and just what you have to determine what your the people that you're trying to, to reach or just what their expectations are. Yeah, I mean, I suspect in like a few years there'll be some sort of AI that just does those conversions automatically as best they can be done. But who knows? Right. Um, yeah, I, I, I know that I think there's going to be technology maybe in a few years. It'll take, you know, even the 15 second ads will seem too long and they'll figure out the best, you know, six seconds or three seconds to, to distill. It'll just get shorter and shorter. I think that's right. You know, um, 
but like also we lose something, you know, the storyteller in me goes, you know, when everybody says that like what happens then is that like the long form stuff loses its like shine because everybody just starts thinks, you know, is thinking about like that 10 second clip, that five second clip, that 15 second clip. And like, you know, we're already living in a world where we're losing nuance. We're losing like the ability to like read long form journalism or to engage in, you know, something that's deeper. And so, you know, we do run the risk of damning ourselves <laughs> to, to an ever shortened, ever like curtailed view of the world. Yeah, I, I wonder if there'll be some sort of hybrid because as your point, you know, I think, you know, Netflix and Amazon Prime and, and Disney TV, you know, a lot of people are watching that content on their phones and it's still maybe, you know, 30 minute, 60 minute videos, but there's also, I think, a space for for shorter storytelling. I, so I think mobile is kind of a, a frontier in terms of, of your video possibilities, it seems. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I, I'm curious, I guess, in, you know, over the next few years, you know, as you mentioned, a lot of political advertisers, um, and even some of the more what we'll call like brand advertisers, maybe aren't quite as much in, in mobile. Um, do you see that shifting um, in the in the near term? Or do you think sort of the, the mobile ecosystem is going to evolve kind of separate from sort of the advertising that happens in, in TV, for example? I don't know. I mean, I think advertisers think in terms of like, they, they look at their budget, they look at their objectives and they try and decide where they're going to put that. And, you know, some of that will be um, the highest profile stuff I think will go to broadcast still. We'll go to like, you know, marquee purchases like a Super Bowl or Academy Awards or a, you know, Sunday football, whatever that, is, you know, whatever that looks like. Um, and then they'll, they'll be creating more and more for different platforms. Right. And so, I mean, I'm doing a, a project right now where it's like designed for Instagram and YouTube from the ad agency and the client, you know? And so I think, I think there's a lot of room for growth in the mobile space and not a lot of buyers are thinking that way yet. And, um, I hope, for for my own selfish reasons, I hope that it doesn't catch on that quickly, or else we'll be priced out of it. But but like yeah, I mean I think it's it's bound to grow and it should grow because it's it's a solid, you know. Right now it's a good it's a, it's an incredible I think um, return on investment and the experience of working in the platform was really was exciting for us. When it, if it becomes like ad buying on Facebook, it's gonna be a lot less exciting. You're right. Um, yeah, and I think you bring up a good point is um, it's it's so easy to think in, in the old way of like, there's one, you know, TV screen that everyone huddles around, but we all have so many different screens. Um, and I think you bring up a good point, mobile is going to be one uh, of many important screens in our lives in the future. Yeah, or you just make the mistake to think it's not already the important, you know. I mean, I spend more time on mobile than I do uh, watching a television screen when I'm a filmmaker. <laughs> and you're, I think you're certainly not alone in that breakdown. Yeah. Uh, fantastic. Well, um, I guess, Lee, for, for anyone else tuning in, um, any, any advice that you, you want to offer? Uh, like such a broad statement, Matthew, <laughs> like, uh, you know, I, I, I guess my, my only thing is like to, to try those things out, you know, like I think for us, it was, we saw an opportunity to, um, take, a, 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 for us, it just really aligned to do the campaign that we did and work with you guys and to like work on that platform. And to, um, it was a perfect 
end game play for us, right? Because we also knew that we couldn't create content quickly enough if we were left to do it ourselves because we'd have to go shoot it, edit it, fight with the editor, figure it out, knock it down, get other people to like make their notes. You know, it just was like, instead we were able to really, I think, harness stuff that was in, in, in effect already market proven, right? Like the thing about working with these creators is that they already had audiences. We could already see the algorithms at play by how many likes these videos had or how many views these videos had. And they had as creators. And the engagement in the community and the conversations that their work was able to like foster. And so I think for us, just like being able to like take something that we were confident in, turn it around in six hours and know that it was like running overnight, you know, and serving and doing that work for us was really exciting. Fantastic. Yeah, just uh, being willing to experiment and try new things and, and know that you're, you're not reinventing the wheel here. Definitely. Fantastic. Well, Lee, um, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Matthew. It was a, it was a really exciting. Um, thanks for spending this time with me talking about the work. Yes, absolutely. Take care. Okay, bye-bye. Take care. Be well.